This is chapter four of our employment law course, Canada Labor Code. So the objectives for this chapter four are to understand which employers and employees are governed by the Canada Labor Code. In other words, which employers and employees are federally governed, federally regulated. And then we'll identify and describe the subjects uh, covered in each of the three parts of the Canada Labor Code. We'll discuss or just revisit the right to strike and lockout because we discussed this in Chapter 3. Principles are similar here. And then we'll look at some key rights and responsibilities uh, with regards to workplace health and safety and look at the concept of danger um, on the Canada Labor Code. So the Canada Labor Code will cover employers and employees that operate in the federal jurisdiction. Operating the federal jurisdiction means uh, trans-provincial operations, so operations that uh, cover more than one province and examples are banking, telecommunications, transportation, crown corporations, first nation. So those are some examples. So there are uh, companies or organizations that operate um, either here in BC or Alberta or in any other provinces uh, but Regardless of the fact that they are based uh, in a province, uh, they may be regulated and governed by the Canada Labor Code uh, due to their uh, main business. So, yeah, banks. Banks are a good example. So, RBC uh, banks. So, employees of RBC, uh, whether they are uh, here in BC or or in Manitoba or Quebec, they are governed by uh, the Canada Labor Code. So the Canada Labor Code has uh, three main parts, and they are industrial relations, part one, part two, occupational health and safety, and then part three uh, will deal with standard hours, wages, vacations, and holidays. Uh, whenever there are disputes or issues uh, with regards to the Canada Labor Code. Uh, those issues and disputes or complaints, they will be handled by administrative bodies. So administrative bodies are not part of the court system. They are part of the executive branch, uh, but they function similar, not the same, but similarly as the court because they hear complaints they render uh, decisions uh, they have even uh, the power to issue uh, orders uh, remedies to certain situations so those uh, administrative tribunals uh, they were and are established to hear cases uh, under each separate part this part one, two, or three. And why why uh, are there administrative bodies or tribunals? Why are not the courts used? Well, this was a decision from uh, lawmakers, politicians, uh, the parliament. So they passed law. Uh, when they passed law, the Canada Labor Code, they understood that issues or disputes arising from the Canada Labor Code should be dealt with by specialized administrative bodies or tribunals uh, rather than the courts. So it was a uh, political decision. So let's look at part one. Part one deals with the industrial relations um, <clears throat> and it is actually uh, related to unionized workplaces or where employees are trying to form a union. Uh, that bargaining unit 
is uh, trying to become a union. And there's the Canada Industrial Relations Board. They adjudicate, they hear complaints, they render decisions for any disputes related to this part one. They also have the powers uh, and duties that are similar to the Provincial Labor Relations Board we saw in chapter three. Uh, so here we'll actually most be a review of what we saw in, in chapter 3 because of uh, union so those powers uh, some examples of those powers are to conduct hearings uh, on violations of the Canadian Labor Code also uh, conduct the representation vote uh, with regards to uh, attempting to form a union uh, to certify a union uh, is still with this uh, related to certifying the union, determining the bargaining unit size and the composition. They also have the power to order remedies uh, in case uh, unfair labor practice complaints uh, are brought to them. And the orders that are uh, issued by the Canada Industrial Relations Board, if they are not complied with, um, in a voluntarily way, then courts uh, will enforce those orders. But the ones issuing the orders, uh, the one uh, body issuing those orders uh, is the Canada Industrial uh, Relations Board. Only in case <coughs> uh, the organization uh, or company does not voluntarily comply with them, then courts uh, will have the power to enforce. So, um, with regards to um, forming a union, uh, again, a review from chapter uh, three, even though there are some uh, different figures here, and I will point uh, this out to you. So, we learned that uh, a union has to be certified, and once once uh, certified, uh, it will be the exclusive bargaining agent. Um, with regards to negotiating for those employees, the employees that form the union. So certification uh, here uh, requires a, a vote by secret ballot and more than 35% of the affected employees uh, have to be, uh, have to vote for the union. And you may remember that in chapter three, that figure is uh, 45. Uh, and then once the vote is there, so uh, let's say, uh, just using here some examples, uh, some numbers, for example. So we have 10,000. Uh, this is the potential number of employees for a specific um, bargaining unit. So at least, 35% of those of these 10,000 employees, so 3,500 have to vote. They have to put their vote. And out of those uh, 3,500, 50% plus one must vote in favor to uh, unionize or to create a union. Okay, so that's uh, how it works. Uh, a question here, what if an employer sells the business? So let's say um, employees are trying to form a union or they have formed a union uh, for uh, HSBC uh, Bank and then uh, HSBC is sold to another um, bank or they merge. What happens? So the union is still there. However, the union will now negotiate with the new employer. So the union does not disappear. The union does not end by the mere fact that the employer uh, sold the business. Uh, this is not the case if the employer closes the business. So let's say now during this uh, COVID moment, COVID-19 uh, moment, a 
um, federally regulated employer has to shut down the business, then the union uh, will cease to uh, exist uh, too. Uh, continuing, so with regards to collective bargaining and the collective agreements, uh, we already know what collective agreements are. They cover all employees in that uh, bargaining unit. Uh, the contents will be negotiated between the employer and the union, so no more individual contracts anymore. And then requirements for that collective agreement based on the Canada Labor Code are uh, there has to be notice to bargain. So either parties will send a notice uh, to the other to uh, start bargaining in good faith. Bargaining in good faith is another uh, requirement. Technological change, as we saw, Tucker 3 as well, uh, is required. Uh, Grieving processes, uh, there has to be, so maybe there's a negotiation uh, when a dispute arises and after 30, 60 days, if uh, there's no uh, outcome or positive outcome, then there can be a mediation or parties will go straight to uh, arbitration. So whatever the grievance processes are, they have to be uh, detailed and described in the collective agreement. Uh, dues check off, so how dues, uh, uh, how employees are uh, paying their dues. Uh, they may be deducted in a pay stub, for example. And there, there, uh, there's also a requirement for um, a conciliation, a mandatory conciliation uh, with regards to the first collective agreement um, in case a dispute cannot be uh, solved uh, between the union and the employer. Uh, strikes and lockouts, we also saw this in chapter 3, so uh, a secret ballot vote is required for a strike and lockout can be initiated by the uh, employer. Uh, so some rules here, uh, and again, many of them are uh, the same as the ones we saw in Chapter 3. So there cannot be uh, either a strike or lockout if the collective agreement uh, is in force. Uh, in other words, a strike or lockout is only legal if the collective agreement has expired, uh, has terminated and a new one has not been uh, agreed upon yet. Uh, here, for federally regulated employees, uh, a mandatory conciliation uh, is required, uh, is necessary first before a strike or lockout uh, is decided upon. Um, in case there will be a strike or lockout, a 72 hour notice is required. Uh, operations must continue. Uh, as such, uh, it prevents danger to the public. So, at least minimum uh, workers have to work for um, necessary uh, services, for uh, important services. There can be replacement of workers because if there could be uh, the strike or the lockout, uh, not the lockout, but the strike uh, would lose um, its uh, importance, its uh, objective. Uh, employees cannot be disciplined when they are on strike if the strike is uh, legal. Uh, benefits and pensions, they must continue and the works will get reinstated um, when either the strike or lockout is ended. Um, even though sometimes there are disputes with this, uh, one, yeah, one or two years ago, there was the uh, post office strike, federal government, um, they uh, threatened to hire other employees. So sometimes we uh, read in the some issues uh, with regards uh, with trying to hire uh, other employees or threatening to um, 
fire uh, employees. That would be, in principle, illegal, unless uh, the law is changed, the Canada Labor Code is changed. So some of the unfair labor practices, uh, they will be the same as we saw in Chapter 3, so interfering in the formation of a union uh, could be uh, during the formation or during a strike uh, to intimidate or to threat or to coerce uh, employees. Uh, raiding, which is another group uh, trying to uh, persuade uh, members of a union to join their union or to form another union. Uh, discrimination against the employees uh, who want to join the union or who are part of the union. And also uh, organizing uh, the union on the employer's property. So this is not allowed unless the employer uh, gives um, consent, unless the employer uh, allows or permits such organization on their premises. So here you could um, stop a little bit, pause the video, and check if this is a true or false uh, question. So this is a similar not the same, but a similar question you may see in your uh, exam for the true or false uh, questions. So I'm giving you some time. I can pause and then. So the answer here is uh, false. It is saying the purpose of certification is to establish the union as the main bargaining agent for the group of employees who voted to unionize. Um, yes, this is right, but the second part is not right. However, employees who didn't vote, because remember only 35% uh, of employees are required to vote, there can be more, but at least 35. So employees who didn't vote to unionize can still negotiate their own terms and conditions of employment. So this is false. When the union is formed, there can't be individual employment contracts. Everything will be uh, between the union and the employee. That's why this is false. So moving on, we'll look at part two. Now we look at occupational health and safety. And by the way, for provincially regulated employers and employees, we'll have a specific uh, chapter on this. Uh, here, we'll just look at this topic with regards to the Canada Labor Code Part 2. So the objective of the occupational health and safety uh, part is to prevent accidents and injuries that are uh, either uh, linked with or that arise out of uh, employment or the employment relationship or that takes place in the course of employment. So this is very important. The objective is to prevent accidents and injuries. So there's a high burden here to prevent because this is logical. It is much more efficient to uh, prevent an accident or injury than sometimes to remedy uh, the consequences of an accident or an injury. So not only um, do the terms of the Canadian Labor Code uh, apply here in this part, but there are also uh, additional regulations uh, showing us that this part of the Canada Labor Code is very, very important. So some examples here, the uh, Aviation Occupational Health and Safety Regulations, uh, Maritime Occupational Health and Safety Regulations. So specific industries, they have their own regulations. And why? Because there are uh, specific uh, details that pertain, pertain to those specific industries that uh, needed to be detailed uh, much more. And this detailing is made uh, via uh, regulations. 
danger. So we need to define danger. What is danger? How danger is defined by the Canadian, uh, for, by the Canada Labor Code? So it is defined as any hazard, condition, or activity that could reasonably be expected to be in an imminent or serious threat to life or health of a person exposed to it before the hazard or condition can be corrected or the activity altered. So this is the definition of danger. And here we also have to look at this uh, case law, uh, Trigvason versus Transport Canada, because uh, it gives us the tests and also more uh, information to define danger or to interpret danger as per the Canada Labor Code. So this case law uh, teaches us that harassment, discrimination, bullying, they are also situations of dangers, danger. And the illness uh, that, is, that is potentially or allegedly caused uh, by the danger, by the threat or by the hazard, uh, related to the employment or during the course of employment, that illness uh, has to, to have uh, persuasive evidence. So the evidence here uh, <clears throat> must be proved um, by expert witness, by a doctor, by a psychologist, by a counselor, so depending on what the illness is, um, a specialist will need to uh, provide evidence of the illness. And there has also uh, to be evidence that the illness was further aggravated or that could have been aggravated by that condition uh, in work. So this will also uh, constitute uh, danger as per the Canada uh, Labor Code. So again, here it's very important to remember that harassment, discrimination, and bullying, they are also situations uh, of danger, and that the illness or the aggravation, aggravation of that illness uh, cannot be just claimed. It has to be uh, supported by uh, clear evidence by expert witness um, evidence, so a specialist uh, in those illnesses. So because this part is so important, uh, there are responsibilities. And the responsibilities, they fall uh, under the employer and the employee as well. So both parties here will have uh will be responsible uh responsible to what responsible to prevent accidents and injuries so what are the main or the key responsibilities of uh, employers they have to develop policies procedures regulations they have to notify employees of non or foreseeable hazards so let's say um if the employee uh, will be exposed to uh, some uh, substances or some pollution. Um, so what, what are the dangers uh, the employee may be exposed to? So employees have to be notified on them. And then the employees have to be trained in safe procedures. Um, in case an incident, an injury or accident takes place, uh, it has to be investigated and reported. Records of those have to be maintained. And buildings, equipment, conditions, um, they need to meet the prescribed standards and employers need to ensure uh, those are met uh, as per the prescribed standards. Uh, with regards to employees, they are required to use safety equipment, they are required to follow safety procedures, and they have to report hazards. And here, the employee is responsible, but also 
manager supervisors they are responsible for supervising for ensuring the employees are uh, complying with their responsibilities in other words they are responsible for ensuring employees are using the safety equipment on a daily basis and if they don't have send them back home that the employees are following the safe, safety procedures and if they are not they also may be sent home they may the employees may receive warnings could be a verbal warning initially could be a written warning uh, etc uh, of offenses and punishment so if uh, prevention uh, is not performed as prescribed by the Canada Labor Code there may be punishment so fines here for those offenses they may be up to 1 million uh, there may be also prison term of up to two years for directors for managers for senior executives uh, both punishments are available so both fine and prison term depending on the seriousness of uh, the offense and as i said any person that uh, officers directors agents any person exercising managerial or supervi uh, supervisory uh, supervisory uh, functions because they are the ones to ensure uh, the employer is complying with their uh, responsibilities and also the employees are uh, doing so and there's a defense called uh, reasonable care and due diligence so in case a company is fined um, or a company is uh, allegedly uh, committing an offense under part two of the Canada labor code they may present a defense this defense is called reasonable care and due diligence and this defense is basically saying that manager has done everything a reasonable person uh, would do to prevent an accident here reasonable person is not a perfect person is not an average person it is a similar person uh, that would be in the position of that manager so if that manager is an engineer in a, in a company with engineering services so that the reasonable person would be another engineer working in a similar first uh, function if it is a uh, manager of a bank uh, so another manager a similar uh, person uh, in a position of that manager okay so not an average person not a perfect person but a, a comparable person uh, in terms of experience uh, expertise and also position uh, duties and responsibilities they have and on page uh, actually I'm saying here on page one two three but um, you just need to double check uh, because that was on addition uh, three for addition four um, should be a different page but you have a list of further recommendations um, so that the employer can rely on in this defense for reasonable care and due diligence uh, so right to refuse unsafe work the employee may refuse work if uh, the employee believes that there can be an accident or an injury resulting from the work and the employer cannot retaliate so let's say an employee arrives to work and learns that the equipment uh, has a different sound seems not to be working properly and that could result uh, in an accident or injury so the employee may refuse work and refusing work here does not mean that the employee will then go home watch netflix for the day no the employee will refuse work but will immediately report that to the supervisor so they can try to fix they can call maintenance uh, for that equipment and the employee may uh, be uh, sent to a different uh, unit or to a different job duty uh, but will keep on working not in 
uh, that place where an injury or an accident may happen until that condition is corrected or that equipment is fixed. So you refuse work, but immediately you report to your manager, to your supervisor. Um, in case the supervisor or manager, they disagree, uh, you can then uh, scale it up and uh, refer the issue to an internal workplace health and safety committee. Um, and then uh, if that doesn't, uh, work uh, either uh, nothing is done no correction is put in place uh, for that uh, situation or hazard then um, you can refer to the minister and the minister will appoint an investigator uh, to assess whether there's a hazard in place that has to be corrected or not uh, and, and I usually say here that um, it's really employee may refuse work, but actually the employee must refuse work if there is likely to be an accident or, uh, or an injury. Um, as long as the employee follows the steps uh, I just told. Because prevention uh, is the key objective here. So um, I usually say it's both a right and an obligation. So the employee has a right to refuse unsafe work, but also has an obligation to refuse unsafe work so uh, that an injury or an accident uh, is avoided. Uh, and even though everything is done, uh, everything that is possible is done to prevent an accident or an injury, sometimes it happens. And when it happens, uh, an investigation has to take place and depending on the circumstances of that uh, accident uh, there may be charges under the code so it may be related to an offense uh, even though those charges may be defended by the employer using uh, the, do, the due diligence and defense we just saw uh, the reasonable care and due diligence. So another true or false uh, question for you. So you may pause the video. <clears throat> so in the Canada Labor Code, uh, Canada Labor Code, occupational health and safety is entirely the responsibility of the employer. This is false. We just saw that both the employer and employee have uh, responsibilities to avoid accidents or injuries. So moving on, the last part, standard hours, standard hours, wages, vacations, and holidays. So <clears throat> those um, provisions, they are the same as the ones in the Employment Standards Act. Uh, let me say here, Alberta and BC, because the textbook is... Uh, um, related to both provinces and the minimum requirements uh, have to be met so minimum wage for that province uh, minimum uh, vacation entitlement etc etc uh, with regards to minimum wage by the way uh, the Canada Labor Code will follow the provincial legislation uh, in other words and this is uh, really interesting. Uh, an employee working for a bank uh, in BC may get uh, may get a different salary from or wage uh, from a similar employee in a different province uh, if they get uh, minimum wage, for example, because the minimum wage varies from province to province. And this is not discrimination. This is not uh, an equality uh, uh, with regards to wage because the code itself prescribes that the minimum wage will be the one set by the provincial legislation. Uh, there's also uh, no federal work compens compensation board, uh, but still employers are required to have an insurance plan. And many of those employers, they subscribe to the Provincial Workers' Compensation uh, Board. Uh, again, there isn't one, 
they need to have insurance and the workers' compensation board, the provincial one, offers them a good solution in terms of uh, insurance plan for uh, the employees. And there are unjust dismissal provisions. So employees who are not covered by uh, collective agreements, so employers, federally regulated employers um, that are not unionized, um, and employees for those employers who believe uh, have been dismissed uh, in an unjust way, uh, they may file complaints uh, for the board, for the Canada uh, Labour uh, Board. With regards to hours of work, so average eight hours per day, uh, it cannot exceed 40 hours per week. And well, when we say it cannot exceed, it cannot exceed, it means if it exceeds, overtime will be paid at a rate of 1.5. Uh, the regular rate. So yes, employees can work over 40 hours per week. However, they uh, need to be paid 1.5, uh, the regular rate. Uh, the workers, they can vote to increase the standard hours uh, up to a maximum of 48 uh, weeks. Uh, some exceptions to this 48 hour maximum, in case it was voted, uh, will be with regards to an accident or urgent or essential work or any unforeseen or unpreventable circumstances so yes this maximum may be uh, may be disrespected so employees may work more than 48 hours in those circumstances and the schedules uh, for the employees uh, they need to be posted in uh, 30 days in advance uh, holidays, well, vacation and holidays. So, vacation minimum two weeks. And there are nine uh, statutory holidays or general holidays. Uh, and here, one is uh, not provincial. Uh, all others, they are also provincial, we'll see. But this Boxing Day. It is only a federal holiday. It is not a provincial statutory holiday, even though some companies, uh, they make it a day off for, for employees uh, within provinces, but it's not a statutory holiday for provincially regulated employees. And when the holiday falls on a non-work day, uh, Saturday or Sunday, then uh, the holiday may be observed uh, on the preceding Friday or the following Monday. Leaves of absences. So they are usually unpaid uh, and then will be covered by EI, the Employment Insurance. Uh, employee may continue to receive benefits, but we'll need to pay the premium for those benefits. Uh, some types of uh, leave in the Canada Labour Code will be maternity and parental leave, uh, compassionate care leave uh, with regards to spouse, common law partner, child, parent, uh, critical illness leave. So uh, usually here, not always, but usually here, uh, cancer uh, when uh, someone is affected by uh, cancer. Uh, which, which in some cases are uh, terminally uh, ill uh, illnesses. Uh, death or disappearance uh, leave. Uh, so when a child in this very unfortunate situation of a uh, disappearance or death of a child. Uh, Biverman leave, this one is paid. There's also sick leave and the reserve force leave. Uh, once the leave is gone, is ended, the employee will have uh, the guaranteed bring statement. So the employee uh, will have their job uh, back. Termination. So for terminations, what is um, mostly important for us uh, will be group termination. 
Uh, in other words, when 50 or more employees uh, are terminated, and because those industries, they usually employ a lot of employees, uh, hence when there's a group termination, uh, the employer has to uh, follow some procedures. Uh, the government in, is interested in learning uh, why there's such a group termination. So they want to be involved in those terminations. Uh, one of the requirements is to send a notice. So the employer has to notify the minister 16 weeks in advance and also has to notify the union. The employer must also post uh, the group termination uh, notice at the workplace where employees can see it, can read it. So usually in the cafeteria or a hall or a board of announcements. And at least two weeks before the termination, the individual employees who will be terminated in this group termination will need to get their individual notices. And the employer also has to form a planning committee, a joint planning committee. Uh, joint planning committee uh, means a committee composed by both uh, employees, uh, representatives, and the employer. Uh, and the union, if it is a unionized uh, workplace. And the objectives of this committee is to try eliminating the necessity of uh, the termination. So eventually recommending uh, reducing hours of work or changing job duties or whatever other recommendations may uh, uh, come out. And, and or to minimize the impact and assist uh, the employees that will be terminated uh, to obtain other employment. Could be with training, could be with um, job search uh, tools, uh, review of uh, resumes, uh, practice interview, etc., etc. Uh, with regards to individual termination provisions and here for those in for those employers uh, or those employees who are not in a union so those places that are not unionized so even if an employee is uh, dismissed without cause uh, the employee is entitled to a minimum two weeks pay uh, in lieu of notice plus uh, severance uh, payment. And how much is severance uh, under the Canada Labor Code? So for employees who have worked one year or more, 12 months or more, the severance pay will be the greater of two days wage for each uh, completed year uh, and five days wage at the employee's uh, regular rate of wages. So whichever is the greater uh, of this, uh, the employee will get as uh, severance pay. Uh, and also when I say minimum two weeks pay in lieu of notice, so um, the pay in lieu of notice, uh, the, the expression is saying, so instead of giving notice to the employee, uh, the employee gets a payment. So the employer will come to the employee and say, hey, you can pack up now and you don't need to work anymore from this moment on. Uh, so in this case, the employer is choosing to pay uh, in lieu of the notice. Uh, another situation is uh, when the employer says, hey, you are under notice uh, two weeks from now, uh, at least two weeks from now, uh, your uh, employment agreement will end. So. In those circumstances where the notice is given to the employee, then there's no pay in lieu of notice. But still, uh, severance pay uh, is still there. Okay, even when, uh, even in those situations where the notice is given to the employee. Uh, with regards to the unjust dismissal, uh, 
So in 2016, the Supreme Court of Canada, uh, in this Wilson versus Atomic Energy case, they decided that employers, they need to have a just cause uh, to dismiss. So this decision is very important because it, uh, it gives uh, employees some kind of uh, security in their job. So job security. Um, unless you did something wrong, unless you breached the employment agreement, which would constitute just cause, um, employers cannot uh, dismiss employees because if they do so, it would be regarded as unjust dismissal. So you may want to uh, review uh, the summary of uh, Wilson and Atomic, Atomic Energy uh, case uh, with regards to unjust dismissal. And the adjudication process. So in case there are complaints, uh, in case employees complain about their rights being violated under the Canada Labor Code. So this adjudication process is informal, is inexpensive because, as I said, uh, there are administrative bodies and tribunals um, hearing those complaints and rendering decisions, uh, and they are not part of the court system. And the Canada Labor Code, uh, the Canada Labor uh, Branch, they have the power to issue uh, a broad range of remedies, uh, such as uh, ordering the employer uh, to pay the employee or the person compensation, the former employee could be, uh, even ordering the employer to reinstate uh, the person or to do anything else. Uh, that is equitable, or in other words, that is fair, that is just, uh, to remedy um, or to counteract any consequences of the dismissal, and usually uh, unjust dismissal. So again, uh, the administrative bodies are the ones um, adjudicating uh, complaints. Uh, hearing complaints and rendering decisions for uh, any issues, uh, any disputes related to the Canada Labor Code. And one more important thing here, whereas there's no union, because with a uh, union, the collective agreement itself, as I said in the beginning, will have their own uh, grievance processes then those will have to be followed so that's it on the canada labor code uh, chapter four thank you